Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky, see your hand in time, in mind to lead me through the night. We're going to continue today. I've got a short message. and In conclusion, I'm going to prompt us with some questions and we'll have a congregational prayer and we'll be dismissed for the day. I'm continuing in this little series, What's Your Story? Uh, trying to look at, trying to consider folks in Scripture, real people, human beings, folks with families and emotions and jobs like you and I, but not necessarily highlighted or spoken about too often in a typical setting. And so I want to talk about some of those. Before I, I do that today, I want to talk about somebody else. I was, I'm raised in Ohio and I was back in my hometown not long ago. And while there, I attended the church that I was raised in. And any time I visit, since I spent my youth there, there are a lot of people that I enjoy seeing. And of all the folks that I catch up with, there is always one constant. A wonderful man by the name of Clyde Fox. His given name is Rule but he's been going by Clyde since he was a teenager. From my earliest memories, Clyde was part of that congregation. Every time I've gone back home and visited that congregation over the 35 years since I moved away from that city, Clyde has been there. And Clyde is always smiling. He's got the quickest smile in all the Midwest, perhaps in the United States of America. He is one friendly individual. He's a perfect kind of person. You'd want to greet everyone who walks through the church doors and on any visit, he's likely to be serving in just that way. Clyde's not musical. You're not going to see him play in any particular instrument in the worship set or singing in a microphone. He's not gifted in that fashion. You're not going to see him in front of a congregation making presentations of any kind. That's not Clyde's gifting. But you'll always find him serving in some capacity. My sister reminded me of the children's ministry class that he and his wife, Daphne, led for many years. And we began to reminisce and we talked about the Every quarter, there were these sales in those children's classrooms because over the previous three months, the students could earn points for various positive behaviors in the kingdom socially in any regard. And so students then, every quarter, could use those points and you could buy toys or games or activities. And with my points, I once purchased a fishing trip with Clyde. I, I was probably nine or ten years old at the time. I don't recall catching one lousy fish. But I recall my friends and I having the greatest time in that boat. We lost countless numbers of Clyde's lures into the water. Clyde just smiled. We had an amazing time. When I attended that congregation, they were, they were big on events, big events, big dinners, big flea markets, big picnics, picnics, and Clyde was always there. Clyde was there setting up ahead of time. He was tearing down. He was cleaning up. He was smiling the entire time. He's an amazingly pleasant human. He loves young people. When I was a teenager, he hosted and chaperoned and led events that I attended. Later on, it kind of flipped the scenario. As a young minister, I became the leader of the teens in the state of Ohio for that organization. And so I ran a couple weeks of youth camps every summer. And when I ran those camps, Clyde volunteered each of those weeks to serve young people as the camp watchman and the camp security Staying up late at night in a golf cart, running around the many acres of that camp, 
making sure that kids were safe. To my knowledge, to this day, Clyde Fox is still the night security guy at Ohio camp meetings for young people. Professionally, he was a welder. He worked for a steel company in downtown Maslin, Ohio. He's been retired now for years. His wife owns a tax preparation company. My sister works for her. And Clyde comes by during the busiest times of the year and he's bringing food and snacks and smiles for everybody who's putting in extra hours before April 15th. Some years back, a missionary visited their congregation and, and spoke about the need for clothing among the peoples in the congregation and the, the villages where they were ministering. And that struck something in Clyde. And he started collecting donations of clothes. And then he's going to make a visit to Africa. And so first he filled one big old suitcase full of clothes and he delivered it to the church in Africa. And then he collected multiple suitcases full of clothes. Had to make more than one trip. Now Clyde goes at least once a year back to Africa to those same churches to see that a shipping container that he's filled with clothes is delivered to the people that need them. He facilitates the whole deal. Next time I visit Lighthouse Tabernacle in Maslin, Ohio, here's what I know for sure. Clyde Fox will be there. And he'll find me. And he'll smile great big and he'll say in his long time Pentecostal manner, Brother Miller, it is so good to see you. It's comforting. It's a comforting pleasure. I know Clyde Fox will be there. He's a sure, faithful follower of Christ. From Scripture today, I want us to look at another man's story. In Acts chapter 15 and verse number 22, we're jumping in at the end of a circumstance, but I'll explain that in a minute. This is what it says in verse 22. Then the apostles and elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates. And they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. And this is our introduction to the biblical person, Silas. And I wonder today what is his story. Now, Silas of Acts is generally identified with the New Testament name Silvanus of the epistles. Depending on the translation that you read in the New Testament area beyond Acts, it'll say Silvanus. But in other translations, it'll also say Silas. Why? Because it's the same person Silas being the name in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Silvanus being the Latinized version. So, same person, but different ways of saying the same name dependent on the language. Did you get all of that? He served Jesus in the newly developing New Testament church, and references to Silas in Acts 15, that occurred about A.D. 50. And when we first encounter him, he's recognized as one of the leading men among the church in Jerusalem. Now, that's really important in and of itself, but you've got to remember that in that newly developing New Testament church, the Jerusalem church was all that. That was the place. Leaders were dispensed from Jerusalem to other places. Jerusalem was the heartbeat, the central core of the New Testament church. And so the most developed congregation that's in Jerusalem. And in that influential, 
experienced, most founded church of the New Testament, Silas is known as among the leaders and the elders in that congregation. He must have been part of the early group of Christians. He was recognized, obviously, as consistent and proven. And in the situation in Acts 15 where we just talked about, that resulted because Paul and Barnabas came to Jerusalem from Antioch to discuss some doctrine with the elders and the apostles in the Jerusalem church. Silas is in the group. He's part of the discussion. He's there. He's engaged. He's trusted to participate. And once they come up with a resolution to the matter, Silas is one of those that the elders, the apostles, the congregation at Jerusalem said, Silas, we want you to be one of our two delegates to communicate this message. We trust that you understand it. You've got a grasp of what we're trying to communicate. And we trust that you'll go with Paul and Barnabas back to the believers in Antioch. And we trust that you'll communicate that message truthfully to what we have communicated. We believe in you. We trust you. And the Bible records that they did just that and he explained and confirmed the encouraging word from Jerusalem. In fact, it says this, he got to Antioch and in chapter 15 and verse 32, they called a general meeting. And Judas and Silas, both being prophets, forth tellers of good things, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Mission accomplished. They participated in the Jerusalem council, Silas did. He understood the matter at hand. He communicated the message to Antioch believers. And then, sometime after that, Paul and Barnabas, these guys who came from Antioch in the first place, they decided, you know what, we have started a lot of churches in the area. We've communicated the gospel of Christ. People are new believers. Let's go back to those places and see how all those new believers are doing. So they got to mapping out their trip. They got out Google Maps. They planned the best course. And they decided, here's where we're going to go. What they couldn't decide was who they would take as associates on the trip. In fact, Paul and Barnabas got a little upset with one another. It could not be resolved in HR. And so Paul and Barnabas split ways. Fine, you go on your trip, I'll go on my trip, and we'll choose the associates we want to deal with. And who did Paul choose as his companion? Chapter 15 and verse 40 of Acts says this, Paul chose Silas. And as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. I think even that phrase says something about Silas. There was a, a, a little bit of tension, a little bit of sorrow, a little bit of pride and concern. And yeah, Well, you can have Silas, Paul. He can go with you on this journey. We're just going to trust that the Lord takes care of him and keeps his hand on him. We love him here. We, we are grateful for him here. He's an important part of our Jerusalem congregation, but we'll let him go. He hears the call. He's going to surrender to the service of the king, but we're going to trust the Lord takes care of him. To me, feels a lot like this congregation, releasing Noah and Jackie into Monroe. There's a catch-22. We love you. We respect you. You are elders in this congregation, and yet you hear the call to Monroe. And we believe in that, and trusting you to the Lord's care. Silas was chosen by Paul. Again, it's not a fluke. He was proven. He went on the mission to Antioch. He'd been there before. Silas, I think it's interesting for us to note this. Silas didn't get a divine call from God. He didn't have a dream in the night where the Lord said, Silas, you're fixing to leave town with Paul. None of that. No vision for heaven. Rather, 
Paul, an elder, a respected missionary, said, Silas, I need you to come with me and fulfill the work of God. An elder spoke to him. He accepted the call, honored for the opportunity to serve. Silas followed a duty of the kingdom. Evidently, he was content with the general far-reaching call of Jesus. Go into all the world. And that general call was enough for Silas. And so he went with him through Syria, Asia Minor, Macedonia, Thessalonica, and Corinth. Next couple of chapters within the book of Acts contain the story of their missionary travels. There were wonderful conversions. There was significant trouble and even miraculous acts of God. First, they stop in Philippi. We want to find some people that have a sensitivity for God. Someone told him there's some ladies who meet down by the river for a prayer meeting. And so Silas and Paul go down by the river and they begin to preach Jesus to them. And there's a wealthy businesswoman, a successful businesswoman by the name of Lydia. And Lydia finds Jesus on the banks of the river in that city of Philippi. And Silas was there. They're headed back to a prayer meeting a few days later and they come across, they had been followed by this girl in scriptures recorded as a slave girl. And she had been saying, these men are prophets. Listen to what they say. But it wasn't a spirit of the Lord working through her. It was a spirit of the enemy. The Bible says a demon. And at one point in time, Paul just had enough. I appreciate what you're saying, but your motive is wrong and your spirit is wrong. And what you know is not by God, but by the enemy. And he turns and says, be cast out from her and set her free. And she's free. Silas was there. A few days later, those who owned this young girl, who profited from her demonic revelations were ticked. They were charged an admission at a carnival tent. Come and get your future delivered by the little girl that can tell you everything that's going on. With the demon gone from her, she doesn't say those things anymore. She doesn't have those quote-unquote prophecies anymore. And they're mad because their livelihood, their income has been set out. They're not happy for a young lady's deliverance. They're ticked that their income's been reduced. So they come serious. It's going to be a mob. It's going to be a fight. They're after Silas and Paul. They catch them. They strip them. They beat them. They toss them into prison. And at midnight, Silas is the one singing harmony beside Paul in the jail. They're worshiping God in the middle of all that. They're thanking Him like we did earlier today in this service. They're thanking God. And while they're thanking God, an earthquake hits rattles the entire prison, opens doors, and oddly, I've never heard this in an earthquake, but it opens the chains off their hands. Oh. So they're delivered and they're freed, and they go, and this is what the Bible says. It's so interesting to me. In Acts 16 and verse 40, they're out of jail, and when Paul and Silas left the prison, look what the Bible says. They returned to the home of Lydia. Lydia invited the believers to her home, invited the missionaries into her home. She financed their stay and their ministry in Philippi. There they met with believers and encouraged them once more and then left town. I don't know about you, maybe I'm more human than others. But at that point, if I was Silas, it would have come into my mind, have I done the right thing here? I mean, seeing Lydia find Jesus was amazing, but that whole stripped and beaten and prison and earthquake kind of business, did I really do the right thing here? But there's none of that from Silas. There's no record whatsoever from Silas. In fact, the Bible records he stayed with Paul. If those happened to be fleeting thoughts through his mind, they didn't change his direction, they didn't change his commitment. He remained with him. He stayed there. He kept his commitment. And then this passage, it's amazing to me. The guy has been through this ordeal. 
And then Silas encouraged others. He's been beaten and stripped and imprisoned. He's an earthquake survivor. And on the way out of town, let's go buy Lydia's and have some praise reports. We need to encourage some people. Wouldn't you think it was the other way around? Oh, Silas has got quite a perspective on the works of God. He encourages people before he leaves town. Then they go to Thessalonica, this next town. And believe it or not, it's a very similar experience. New believers, excitement, and another angry mob. they got to leave town under the cover of darkness. Then they get to the next town, Berea. They start preaching there and there's even more success than in these other towns. People are hearing the gospel. They're believing in Jesus. They're being baptized and filled with the Spirit. And then the mob from Thessalonica heard they're in Berea and they come for a fight in another town. Paul left Berea. They said, you got to get out of here. You're going to be in trouble. Silas stayed in Berea. They're hunting him down. They're threatening to beat him. It's, it's, it's a threat to be back in the prison again. But Silas stays in Berea and he partners with Timothy and they keep on preaching the gospel. Later they meet in Corinth, back with Paul again. And Silas and Timothy are preaching the gospel in Corinth. And that is the story of Silas at this point. Preaching. Deliver important messages, facing angry mobs, beatings, jail, miracles. And then, it appears that Paul assisted, rather Silas assisted Paul in writing Scripture. Look at this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says this. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Anybody else ever noticed that before? Me neither. I never noticed that before. There it is. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians opens exactly the same way. Now perhaps Silas was just delivering letters. Maybe he was a scribe who penned what Paul was dictating. But maybe... Since Silas was in Thessalonica and he helped to start that church and he was invested in some new believers there, perhaps he offered some content along with Paul and Timothy as well to include the encouraging letter to the Thessalonians. It says we are writing to the church. Regardless of the dimension, he's credited, he participated in this important letters, these important letters. And now this, the final mention of Silas in Scripture. It occurs in 1 Peter. It's recorded by the Apostle Peter, another well-known apostle. This reference is about 15 years later. 15 years removed. 1 Peter 5, the Scripture says this. Peter's closing out his letter. I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. Written this and sent it with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. How did Silas' story that we have looked through here just briefly today, how did that story involve such opportunity and such responsibility? Peter commended Silas as a faithful brother. Faithful. Reliable. Trustworthy. Sure. Steadfast. Believing. Dutiful. Responsible. Dedicated. Loyal. The last word on Silas' story is this. He was faithful. Faithful. It's a faithful traveling companion to Saul or Paul, excuse me. He was there during the highs and lows. He never walked away. He stuck with it. He was faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
telling others about the Lord, preaching about the Lord, being involved in letters delivered and written because of the Lord. He's a faithful communicator. Can I just remind us once again, Silas' story is real. He's a, a genuine human like you and me. What are you saying? I'm saying Silas dealt with circumstances in his life. <laughs> But they didn't hinder his faith. Silas dealt with the emotions that come with those circumstances. High, low, and neutral. He lived like you and I live, but his emotions didn't override his faith. Silas dealt with distractions and options. He could have done something else besides go on a missionary journey. He could have been in another career besides the kingdom of God. There were options. There were considerations. There were distractions like any other human. But he didn't permit them to minimize his faith. Just like you and me. Silas dealt with relationships and sickness and money. All of it. But he didn't allow any of it, to diminish his commitment to Jesus Christ. As Habakkuk explained in our message last week, the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And that's the way as Silas lived. You know, as a, as a descriptor, Let's just talk about you and I and the day and we live today. As a descriptor, as an adjective, faithful. That might sound a little bit boring to some. I mean, after all, Peter didn't describe Silas as, I commend to you, Silas, powerful one. The influential one. Paul didn't, Peter didn't say, you know what? He was a successful brother. I don't commend to you my wealthy brother Silas. He didn't say, I commend to you Silas the important, uh, Silas the fun and exciting brother. It's not what he did. Silas was faithful. And you know, some faithful might seem boring, but the apostle Peter issued it as the highest commendation. He was faithful. Recently, I've spent some time reading the entire book of Judges in the Old Testament. Just focusing on that entire book of Judges. It spans about 300 years, three centuries in Israel after the life of Joshua and before the time of the kings. And in the judges, there are stories of judges whose lives seem really exciting. If you read the book of Judges, that's where you find the, the victory stories that often get repeated. There's the story of Deborah and her 40-year leadership and the victories that she oversaw with the children of Israel. There's the story of Gideon, another 40 years of great victories in the children of Israel. And then there are some stories of some serious failures, some people that struggle. There's the big stories of Abimelech and Jephthah and Samson. But if you read the whole book, Verse after verse after verse after verse lists judges who have little or no information recorded. Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and Tola and Jair and Ibzan and Elon and Abdon. Scripture doesn't record their victories nor their losses. Maybe they served during peaceful times. They faced no significant challenges. Uh, apparently, they didn't suffer any great failures or face tragedies that needed to be overcome. Maybe the years of their service was kind of boring. Maybe the years of their service weren't interesting. There they are. 
They're listed. They're recorded. They served. They led. They bridged the gap. They kept Israel moving forward. You know what I discover in the book of Judges? You know, the stories that are the headlines, the attention getters in the book of Judges. Those leaderships, both victories and failures, cover about 100 years of that span. But the also-rans, the bylines, the short stories, 200 years of leadership, the majority of those who served the work of God and the kingdom of God weren't the big headlines, but those who simply remained. They were consistent. They were dutiful. They were steadfast. And their greatest service was they were faithful to the Lord. Faithful. Silas. If you look up the meaning of the word Silas, it means from the forest. From the forest. That was his name. Silas from the forest. I don't know about you, but when I get into the woods, when I'm hiking, I often notice the tallest trees. Anybody else? I like to get as close as I can and lean back. And to whoever's with me, they'll get this question. How tall do you think that is? <laughs> and then we all throw out ridiculous numbers. Well, that's a tall one, ain't it? Some of you are thinking, my God, our pastor's a simpleton. <laughs> Sometimes it's not the tall ones that grab my attention, but the ones where the base diameter is just massive. Just massive. If, you're, if you drive to Mount Erie to be able to go to the top for that view, the little road that accesses there, you get pinched on that little road between two massive trees right beside the road. They can't widen the road for these massive trees. Now, if you're a Washingtonian and you've never been to Mount Erie, shame on you. Big around, the impressive trees. The impressive trees. But you know, on their own, those trees, tall or big in diameter, do not make a forest. A forest is a collection of trees. All ages, all sizes, planted, rooted, standing, strong. A forest is all the trees. Silas, from the forest, faithful. Often when you and I are searching for solutions to challenges in our lives or, or direction for our next steps or our course ahead, we scan in our lives, if you will, for the giant trees. I need to find me a tall one or a broad one. I need some kind of big solution. I need a, a one-time, standalone response. I, I need something big to come into my life in order to get me through this time. We might think great successes are only achieved by famous victories. And what I preach today is simply this. That's not the case. Not at all. Thank God for the staggering trees we read about in Scripture. Moses and Abraham and Isaiah. Thank God. Thank God for the massive trees Peter and James and John recorded in Scripture. Thank God. But the forest, the innumerable trees covering the millions of acres are populated by trees named Silas. Can I simply encourage and inspire every hearer today? The kingdom of God goes forward because of Silas. Because of people who show up. People that are engaged and contribute. Trees that are reliable and loyal. Amen. 
Silas' story summarizes the innumerable multitude of God's followers that have little or no mention in Scripture or in history. We'll only know about them when we stand around the throne of glory and the multitudes whose names have not been recorded here and may not be recorded in our minds, but they're written in the Lamb's book of life. The, the fullest of the faithful. <laughs> Psalmist David understood the blessing of faithfulness in Psalm 31 and verse 23. Oh, love the Lord, all you saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful. The Lord preserves the faithful. In Proverbs 28:20. Scripture says a Solomon, a faithful man will abound with blessings. A faithful or trustworthy person will abound with blessings. Silas' story proves Solomon's wisdom. A, a faithful man will abound with blessings. Here's what Silas' story teaches. How do I stay married? Faithfulness. How do I build and maintain relationships with family and friends? Faithfulness. How do I improve in knowledge and wisdom? Faithfulness. How do I earn respect of my coworkers and managers? Faithfulness. How can I build a fulfilling career? Faithfulness. How can I eliminate debt and build equity? Faithfulness. How do I wisely prepare for retirement? Faithfulness. How do I survive storms in my life? Faithfulness. How do I overcome the setbacks of society? Faithfulness. How do I endure ongoing trouble around me? Faithfulness. How do I deepen and broaden my discipleship? Faithfulness. How do the powerful encounters like I experience in this place today, how do those become lifelong change for me? Faithfulness. How do I create and maintain an influential Christian witness to my family and friends and neighbors? Faithfulness. How do I develop my prayer, my conversations with God? Faithfulness. How do I gain respect of my fellow disciples? Faithfulness. How do I pass my faith on to my children? and grandchildren. Faithfulness. How can I impress the Lord of glory with the life I'm living in this world? Faithfulness. Faithful, faithful, faithful. To some, faithful sounds boring. But for the righteous, faithful promises abounding blessings. Abounding blessings. Faithful. Silas, Paul wrote, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. A fabulous commendation. And the final word on Silas. Faithful. Every one of us here viewing online, all of us, human beings, are free moral agents. We make our own choices. Every single day, we make our own choices. Choices that add up. 
Choices that accumulate. Daily choices that we must be known and understand. Determine. Daily choices that determine our lives' final summary. And every one of us is free to chase whatever suits our fancy. Me? I'm chasing Silas's commendation. You know, when it's my time for my life to be summarized, for Jesus himself to review my time on earth, I want to hear the master say, Travis, well done. Good Faithful servant. Faithful. I want Jesus to see me from the forest. Among the vast collection of followers over the ages. I can't speak for you. Each of us makes our own choices. But for me, I want Silas' story to be my story. So when sincere in a desire like that, there are two things that got to be considered, and I close. Two things. Areas and practices. Areas and practices. I, I've got to ask, what areas, in what areas do I need more faithfulness? In what areas do I need more faithfulness? And then the second question, what practices will make me more faithful in those areas? What practices will make me more faithful in those areas. So personal reflection is a great start. Perhaps some of us are reminded right now, well, I can think of a place or two where I've dropped the ball. Self-evaluation can be healthy. But let me tell you what's better than self-evaluation. Accountability. Accountability. Because accountability offers greater perspective where I'm inviting others to examine me. You know what that does? It brings my life into clearer focus. I think I know who I am, but even the Apostle Paul said, I don't trust my own thoughts on myself. But accountability invites the observation of others to help me. What areas can I be more faithful and what practices might I engage in those areas? I guess for me, those questions then is who do I ask? If I'm going to be accountable in these things, who do I ask? Well, for the kingdom of God and the following of Jesus Christ, asking Jesus is the primary start conversations with God, right here, in the Word. Right here, in the Word. Being accountable to this Word. Reading it such that it speaks to me. And in prayer to say to the Lord, Lord, what areas do I need to be more faithful? When it comes to eternal things, are there areas where I need to be more faithful? And Lord, inspire me, direct me, encourage me, challenge me. What practices do I need in order to be more faithful? That's a great place to start. Great prayers to have. Great reasons to read the Word. What about in our humanity? We have tremendous conversations in our faith groups about our walk with God, our discipleship, 
It's been a wonderful, wonderful expedition into accountability where people share, here's what I'm thinking and here's where I need some help and here's where I'd like to grow. It's an environment of encouragement and inspiration. But it's Father's Day. Now, Father's Day is not just a day to talk about fathers, but all of us can reflect on our leadership in our homes, moms and dads alike. So when I think about being faithful in my home, who can I ask about that? Well, it's a great conversation with a spouse. How can I be more faithful? What are the areas where you look at me and you consider me as a husband, a father, as a, 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 somebody who's part of this household contributing to this home. How and what areas can I be more faithful? And listen to the response. Be kind to us. But hear it. And then if areas are brought up, here's the more important part. Don't just tell me you could be more faithful with the money. But offer me some practices. How do you mean? What do you explain by that? What do you mean faithful with the money? Well, you know, thank God for a house. Thank God for some food. But we haven't taken a vacation in six decades. It'd be nice if we had three or four cents to rub together and get out of town on the weekend. Maybe if you bought fewer shotguns and fishing poles, we could go on a vacation. I'm meddling now, aren't I? <laughs> but that goes the other way. What are you talking about? I'm talking about areas of faithfulness and practices to improve our faithfulness. Having a conversation. If you're a parent, you're a spouse, having a conversation with a parent or spouse that you regard and respect. For instance, if your parents are still around, you want to know a little bit more about being a father or a mother, talk to your parents. How, how can I be more faithful? You observe my life. Let me just say this about mentoring. I know I'm rambling on, but man, I'm enjoying it. Here's who we want to be accountable to as a mentor. Somebody who lives thousands of miles away and doesn't observe our lives. I'll call Uncle Beauregard, who lives in southern Louisiana, and ask him how I'm doing as a father. He's always like me. I'm sure he'll say I'm doing fine. Well, that's not accountability. How about we talk to some fathers that we respect, some men of God that we respect, somebody who knows our life, who watches our lives, who we trust to give us some important questions and to ask us some details Tell me about these practices. Tell me about those practices. I've seen this in your life. I've seen that in your life. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about being faithful. Making ourselves accountable. How about talking to our children? How can I be more faithful serving you as a parent? What are some practical things? That I, what areas can I grow in? Now, you'll notice I'm not allowing for any deviation that there might not be any areas. <laughs> there are no perfect humans, particularly in the house of God. Just want to make that clear. Well, I'm in the church today, preacher. I'm perfect. I'm sorry. You're confused. <laughs> We're following one who's perfect. And doing the best we can to be more faithful more often in more areas. What are the areas where I can improve? And what are the practices? And how will I be accountable? Would you bow your heads? Lord, it seems to me that we live in a society that's not excited about faithfulness. In so many things, in so many ways, we've fallen into a system of things that seems to prevent faithfulness. Marriages aren't what they used to be. 
Many a school teacher complains that parents are not engaged and involved with their children. In this day and age, Lord, it's so rare that somebody spends 10 or 20 or 30 or more years with a company. They're not faithful to an employer anymore. And that being the case, we're usually not very faithful to a place that we live, to a neighborhood, to a house. We, we move from place to place. Our attention spans are so short. We're not faithful to a vendor. We're not faithful to a store. We're, we just want the best price wherever I can get it. Faithfulness is not what it used to be in the world in which we live. And Lord, I ask for your spirit to reach into our minds and our spirits. I know, Lord, we have to make the choices. I realize and accept, Lord, that it's, it's on me to decide to do what's right every day, to improve and be better day by day. I accept that. I receive that. Lord, I humbly ask You this. Would Your Spirit remind me regularly? As one preacher said, Lord, keep provoking my heart until I change my life. Let Your Spirit, Lord, remind me and challenge me and inspire me. Let Your Word and Your power come to me, Lord, day in and day out, so that it would be over the course of time there is more and more faithfulness for more and more that matters to You and that results in a blessed eternity. Help me, Lord, to have some wonderful conversations with people that matter. Make us trees in the forest of faithfulness. Inspire us. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 I appreciate your receptivity today. I believe in the kingdom of God. There's no accident that we had the kind of worship service that we had today. Because the Spirit of God moving among us softens our hearts. It prepares us for the receptivity of the word. So as you and I made ourselves available to the power of God, now this Word of God, which I don't know about you, but it brings a little tension into my life, and I'm the one who shared it. But it lets that seed get down. And now if you and I will water it with spirit and prayer and sincerity in the days that come, it can take root. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church. In the Holy Ghost.